thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thank you to Trond and the team at the MIT Startup Exchange. It's very exciting for me to be here, um, kind of getting exposed to new communities around Boston that are doing wonderful things related to food. Um, I myself uh, started Branch Food, which is an organization of food startups here in the city. I also work for Salt Venture Partners, which makes early investments in seed and Series A, or sorry, makes seed and Series A investments in early stage food startup companies. And so. We see a lot of what's going on here in Boston. We see a lot of companies expanding to Boston. It's a very exciting time to be looking at food and thinking about new ways of creating it and, and you know just having it be a part of the community here in Boston and seeing so much innovation coming out of the city. Um, <clears throat> so the topic today is what is next in food and innovation. Today, earlier today, we heard from a lot of the companies that are working more on the industry and academic side, um, but we do have some startups in the room that haven't gotten to present yet, so I want to give them the floor. Um, if they could briefly kind of describe what they're working on and um, the vision for the, that they have for the food system. Cool. Uh, I don't know if this, is this a mic? Okay, cool. I've got a mic here. Uh, my name is Gabe Blanchett. I'm co-founder and CEO of a company called Grove Labs. Uh, at Grove, we believe that in the future, everybody can grow some of their own food. Uh, if you can grow it outside in a, in an, in a, in a garden, that's incredible. Uh, but for a lot of people who live in uh, northern latitudes or in cities or even suburbs, uh, it, it can mean growing it inside. So a grove is uh, it's basically a garden in your home. Uh, our first product is it's called the Grove Ecosystem. It's about the size of a bookshelf. Uh, and in it, you can grow all your leafy greens, culinary herbs, uh, and even small fruiting crops like tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's a pretty good wrap. Frederick, would you like to say a couple words about your company? Oh, sure, thanks. I'm Frederick Abramson. I'm the founder of Digital Nutrition. And the purpose of Digital Nutrition is to design mobile apps that give you scores on how well your genetic makeup matches the nutrient stream you're putting in your body. It's a very simple concept. We heard that the food is information, but so is DNA. A dust statement. We're all different in how we metabolize nutrients. We're all different in how nutrients affect our physiology and neurology. Why don't we tap into that DNA, not the disease stuff, the normal, and map that against what we're eating so that we can have people make smarter choices? Not to have them change what they're doing by saying they're bad, but by saying, given what you like, what's the smartest thing for you to do economically, personally, or whatever? I believe that if we focus on changing, letting people tap into this and mapping this into their DNA and their food on an ongoing basis, we can revolutionize the way people deal with food, improve issues around weight, other health issues, without ever getting into the issue of telling them why they're wrong for what we're doing. It leverages all the technology. DNA technology is cheap, fast, and accurate and we know what's in food. It's just marrying databases. The method I have uses a scoring system between zero and 100, tells you how closely something matches your DNA. It's real simple. That's digital nutrition. I think it's the edge of the future. Great. Alan? Thank you. My name is uh, Alain Briançon. I'm the co-founder of a company called Kitchology. Uh, Iris Sherman is uh, my co-founder, and we turn out, uh, it turns out that the two of us are uh, four stations away on the red line uh, outside Washington, D.C. Uh, so we had to, of course, meet in Cambridge. Um, uh, Kitchology is a mobile platform that helps uh, families that are dealing with special diets, uh, food allergy, food intolerances, uh, uh, and other nutritional goals uh, to manage uh, their food decision and help others uh, by uh, sharing their experiences. Uh, the first release of our platform allows a consumer to take a recipe. They have a profile with respect to foods they try to avoid, foods they try to emphasize, and we substitute uh, ingredients based on those goals. We, of course, uh, start, uh, you know, we bring ingredients in and then we bring products uh, from uh, different, board, uh, from different uh, brands. Um, we've been uh, at this for four years. Uh, we decided to uh, launch in a counterintuitive way by first building a community. So we've embedded ourselves very deeply in the food allergy community. Um, uh, we believe they are leading a lot of the discussion taking place with respect to food choices. There's three million people in the US um, that have celiac, so they have a true allergy to gluten. 
but thanks to what I call the Gwyneth Paltrow multiplicative effect, 18 million people uh, manage, uh, want to, uh, uh, are avoiding gluten, and 32 million believe that uh, gluten is bad for you, um, even if they don't know what it is. So we believe that there is a very interesting uh, opportunity with respect to um, you know, helping folks uh, manage their diets, helping folks manage with allergies, and, and we believe that uh, some of the things that the food allergy is adopting is going to ripple through uh, the food ecosystem in, the, in this country and other countries. Great. And we have Jan at the end working on C2Sense, which was actually presented earlier, but a, a new face in front of the crowd. Yeah, so you, you might remember some of the things Tim presented earlier. Uh, what C2Sense is doing is we make sensors that are simple and cheap, uh, miniature, uh, that can help you get more information about your food. It can tell you, is that fish that I just bought, is it fresh enough, can I eat it? Uh, is it avocado ripe, or does it need a few more days to ripen, or in shipping, does my container of bananas contain a banana that's overripe that might spoil everything else. And so far, t there hasn't been technology to give you that information. We have best before days, uh, dates that are just printed. We have temperature loggers, but nothing really that can tell you something about the fruit itself. And this is what uh, we are trying to do at uh, C2Sense, give you sensing, give you information about the food. So for the, the startup founders on the panel that just spoke, what is your vision for working with some of the corporate and academic entities that perhaps presented earlier or are in the greater food system? Um, how do you see yourselves fitting in and, and potentially working with them? I can, I can start with that one. Uh, we're pretty, we're still pr relatively small and young, I think, in our, in our, in our cycle. Um, so. I think some of the some of the sort of corporate partnerships that we could forge would actually hurt us right now. Uh, they'd slow us down. Um, in the future, I could see I could see uh, potential distribution partners or uh, or sort of core science partners um, or some of some of the technologies like LED lights uh, that we've been developing. Uh, there's there's no doubt other companies developing them as well, uh, and so I could see te sort of technology partnerships. Uh, yeah, I think I think I'll leave it at that. In our case, I believe we can work with companies who are interested in designing new types of foods, new, new extensions of product lines. It also allows companies that are big and diverse to let consumers tap into choices more elegantly. You know, Procter & Gamble's soap model is we don't care which brand you buy as long as it's made by Procter & Gamble. <laughs> And so we could do the same thing in food. So the good partner would be able to have consumers know which of the portfolio of foods they have best matches them and even get into further downstream, more personalized uh, food packaging, foods that could be packaged and delivered to consumers. Um, the answer is uh, we'll work with uh, anyone that wants to work with us. So getting that out of the way. And in fact, we have already started. <laughs> Um, because you can imagine the power if you give a consumer the ability and choices to choose different ingredients or different products that some brands and some retailers would like their products to be highlighted first and uh, since it's a platform and it's done in software and it's just software, we know that people that write software just is a four letter word, it's just software we can integrate online stores and there's something we've started to do with some partners. So. We look into uh, retailers and brands being small or big are essential partners. They're really our customers at the end of the day. Uh, they are confronted, and, and it was fascinating to, because to, I, I knew this question could show up, the first question that came about sugar. Um, because there is a shift in our mind that took place about who controls the dialogue around food. It used to be, if big food tells you it's true, then it's bound to be true. And uh, over time, more and more power, real or perceived, uh, has been given to the consumers, or in fact, the consumers have, have taken. So we believe that the nature of the dialogue between consumers that are wanting their lifestyle, wanting their profile to be fulfilled easily, and providers of food, either as a retail channel or as a provider of the packaged food or, or ingredient food, is one that is shifting. And we believe that the right platform with the right dialogue will allow 
this transition to be, to be managed. I mean, the gentleman from PepsiCo, sorry, you're there, uh, you know, said, you know, you could look into some of the movements as threats, but if you look at them as opportunities, we believe that um, these enhanced dialogue will take place. And, and that's the reason why even before we launched our first release of the app, we've seen brands coming to us because they understood the power of this dialogue. So we will, we will talk to anybody that wants to talk with us and we'll try to come up with win-win scenarios. Well, what we are trying to do is uh, we, we see issues in food, uh, food waste, uh, maybe food quality could be improved, and we're trying to bring solutions out uh, to benefit people. And I think the best way to do that is combine what, what we are good at developing sensors with the knowledge of uh, companies, uh, the companies that are here, some, some other companies of uh, how the specific market works, uh, some, let's say, food biology expertise, some expertise around what exact target should we be looking at. Uh, so we are, I think, it's the best way for both sides to combine these areas of expertise. And uh, we've started uh, working with uh, some companies. Uh, we've, uh, we have co-developments that are ongoing, and that's something we definitely want to continue doing. Great. And so for the corporate entities on the, uh, on the panel, as well as academia, um, how do you see yourselves partnering with startups? I mean, Larry, you mentioned that your Monsanto is looking to partner. You're looking at different technologies and companies to work with. You know, PepsiCo, you mentioned the, the Laboratoire and the Wiki Pearls and um, new physical food products that are being created. So how, how do you engage with startups? What are you looking for? And um, Joining outfits like the ILP is a good start, I think, just a shout out. Um, I think most of the answers are fairly obvious and have been mentioned before, but I'll, at the risk of being redundant, I'll add to it. I, um, I think we imagine a future of working in general that's very boundaryless. So these sorts of hard and fast divisions we have between corporates, entities, and startups, and all of that's going to dissolve, I think, I hope. Um, so we're... We, we think of it as sort of preparing for that world in some sense, anticipating that world and preparing for it. And the point's already been made that we might have complementary skills and strengths. And if we're in the business of redesigning entire systems, no one entity in that ecosystem can do it alone. So I think the answers are fairly obvious that we almost need to. Yeah, it's, and for us it's uh, similar. Um, we are interested in working with startups before they even start. In fact, helping them start up or after they've started up, uh, whether they come to us or, or we find them. Um, in fact, it's, it's always more exciting when they come to us. And, and sometimes they'll come to us with solutions that we didn't even know we needed. And uh, thinking about using their technology in a way that we would have never thought about. Um, the, the, it's, um, and, and then how we work with them, it's, normally it's, it's an enabling technology that they have sometimes a risky technology that they have a lot of expertise in, um, but don't have a platform in which to test these things. So one thing we're very good at is, okay, we've got platforms in which to test. You want plants, we'll give you plants. You want fields, we'll give you fields. And, and so it's a, a great marriage usually between a really great idea, a creative idea, a cool technology uh, from the startup with the power of a large testing platform that we have, for example. And so I think that's a great way for us to work with startups. And Omar, I know um, you're obviously in academia. You work with some of the leading uh, healthcare institutions here in Boston. I mean, what can we see coming from MIT? Are there, are there new products coming out of the research and development there? Um, and what are, what are you seeing coming from, from sure. the students? So I, 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 I just want to mention from an academic standpoint, in the field you know that I'm really interested in I think there's a lot of opportunity to really understand how diet and dietary constituents can regulate aspects of tissue regeneration and aging we actually know very little about how you know taking a reductionist approach instead of looking at the whole picture just taking a reduction approach we know very little about how these different fatty acids for example you know regulate these primitive stem cells in given tissue, then we know these stem cells, their function uh, declines dramatically in old age. So, you know, as an academic, we have this very, we've developed this very robust assay where we can grow, you know, many organs from human patients in culture. And we'd be very interested in working with either startups or large companies to begin to identify uh, dietary constituents that might boost 
uh, tissue function in old age. As a physician, uh, you know, uh, we see there's many types of patients that might benefit from this. In my field, the GI field, uh, you know, patients that are afflicted with very serious bacterial infections uh, might benefit from very targeted uh, nutritional interventions. Um, my lab has really f uh, focused on identifying, you know, mediators of these um, effects in low calorie states. So we've identified this molecule, cyclic ADPR, for example, and other uh, pathways uh, which we're interested in pursuing both in the clinic um, and potentially, you know, with startups or, you know, um, uh, food companies in the audience where, you know, maybe by, by modifying one aspect of the diet, you can boost endogenous generation of this one signaling molecule that can have a huge impact on uh, patients or on the elderly. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more um, specifically about it, their applications within those communities or if, you know, there have been startups that you've worked with or tests that you've sort of run with those specific communities that are benefiting from the research that you're doing? So right now, I, I officially launched my lab in September. So right now, we've been really trying to validate these pathways in model organisms. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we have begun talking with uh, our colleagues over at MGH on testing some of these compounds that we've identified in the lab as potential um, effectors that might boost, for example, gut repair in patients that have IBD or um, very bad bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. So we're still in the very early innings. We're still uh, doing a lot of validation. We're trying to really work out the mechanism, both genetically and pharmacologically. But mm -hmm. ultimately, our goal is to really translate what we find um, to patients, mm -hmm. or even to the elderly, just thinking very broadly. Wonderful. Can, can uh, I sure. go a little bit off script? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's making me a little bit uncomfortable that everybody is, is so on board with sort of industry and startup partnering from the start. Actually, I don't agree with the notion uh, necessarily that, uh, that they should sort of merge and become one in the future. I think that there's a, and, and this is very situational, there are, there are definitely companies that should start right under the wing of, of one of these larger, larger uh, sort of larger corporations. But, uh, but there's, uh, there's definitely a role for, uh, for having startups a little bit more isolated. And, and Grove, I think, is, is right now, I'm very happy that we're, uh, we're not partnered uh, to, to any large corporation that has a specific agenda for us. Um, so I, I do think that there's, while, while I'm, I mean, I'm here, I th and I think that there could be great partnerships in Grove's future and in a lot of startups' future, but, uh, but it, I, I, I do think that there's, there's definitely a time and a place for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not always from the birth of an idea. Yeah. So how does, you could articulate a little bit further, how does Grove fit into the picture of the Monsantos of the world, the MIT City Farms of the world? You know, where do you see your beginning and, and perhaps the, the limits of Grove? Sure. These companies have achieved tremendous, uh, tremendous size. Philosophically, we're pretty different from, uh, from both of the, the companies, or the, the you know, Monsanto and uh, the MIT City Farm project. Um, so in terms of in terms of sort of our end, I can see collaborations, uh, but in terms, if you're asking about sort of end game, uh, you know, we'd be pretty we'd be pretty selective on where we where we ended up. Mm -hmm. I, sure. I, I'm tempted to disagree with you just to make sure. things oh, more please, interesting. Please. Yeah. Uh, what's a panel without a little bit of disagreement? Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm actually not going to. I think I know what you're saying. There are. There are diversity in an ecosystem, for those of you who study ecosystems, you know, is a sort of unambiguous good. So I think there's space for lots of different philosophies in the food realm, for example. But just, uh, just looking at the startups in this room, or at least the stuff that I've heard about, I'm struck by how social in orientation most of them are. I think that could be a very humanizing and civilizing influence on some of the big companies and the philosophy that has taken over in some cases. You know? And I'm speaking very generally. Uh, in fact, yesterday, a guy called John Fullerton, who's an ex-managing partner or managing director at Morgan Stanley, who's been sort of a recovering financier, as he calls it, just released a white paper on what he calls the regenerative economy. I encourage all of you to download it and read it. And I think startups are a very vital part of sort of humanizing big company philosophy that in some instances has gone off the rails. Uh, and I very much appreciate that kind of help, I think. 
But the, the sort of collaboration and merging, I'm sort of getting a weird echo kind of thing, um, the merging of styles and philosophies that I see is more around creating trust in the entire ecosystem. I think if you look at the ecosystem now, different constituents distrust different parts. So there are people who mistrust government, there are people who mistrust uh, you know, PepsiCo, there are people who mistrust Monsanto, and there are people who mistrust startups for, for various different reasons. And I think this sort of collaboration, not to say we fuse and become one, but just figuring out where are the best things to work together can raise trust in the entire system. And I think the world needs it very desperately. Great. Yep. I don't know that I can add anything to that. That was, that was excellent. From my perspective, one of the reasons to partner with a large company is that growth is a resource hog. It's difficult to really grow from a startup to have a big impact. A large corporation that has been there and done that can provide the channel access, the resources to accelerate that growth. That also means it has a competitive advantage because the more successful you become, the more likely competitors will come in. So you're maintaining a dominant market share and a dominant position requires resources that are often difficult to get. Large organizations can provide those resources, can provide access to good partners throughout the world. And so to me, it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Alan, it sounds like you're very enthusiastic about working with, with other entities. Uh, I mean, to a large degree, they are, they are customers and future customers. So I would be silly to, uh, it would be a fool, not silly, it would be a fool to say, no, 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 I don't want your money. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and to the investors, we're in the middle of a, uh, seed fund raise, so talk us, to us as well. Uh, I, I think the, the, the point about trust and the post of social to me resonate very strongly. Um, it was an interesting uh, statistics run by um, the Journal uh, of the American uh, Medical Association. It was it's about two years old survey. And they surveyed the American populations and one third of them believes that they are the children of a food intolerance. It's a self-diagnosed condition that impacts your kids. It, first of all, it's a, it's a marketing dream, it's a marketer's dream, but I think it goes to people seeking information. And if you look at information on the web, on TV and whatever, you more and more the web, um, there are conflicting perspectives. I mean, um, and you can't expect a truth to emerge. It, it's too fragmented, people get information differently and whatever you. So there's going to be areas of trust, and it's going to be 1% trust, 98% trust, and whatever you. And you have, Consumers and providers will need to navigate through this ecosystem, literally, which is heterogeneous in nature, and find the right niche and the right position. And what will work for someone will not work for another. Um, so I, I, you know, this is my third startup, so I sympathize with the talk to the big guys at the right moment and don't get shackled. And if you can do it, great. Um, but there are values when you fit in into a global ecosystem where the right <coughs> moment, and you'll know it, and the partners will know it, where you'll have the discussion. So there's not going to be one solution that fits it all. It's, it's a complex system. There are some big, big trends that everybody can leverage. But I think everybody has a, you know, a, a part to play, so to speak. Their things will, you know, their part and what they do will, will vary over time. Um, and, and I think that's what's interesting about it. The thing also which I find interesting about food, uh, as you can tell, I'm a stress eater, so I've been kind of you know, over-consuming uh, food for a while, but this is, this is the joy of doing a startup, is the nice thing about food is that everybody can relate to it. I was listening, kind of, you know, not spying, kind of listening into the discussion today as groups are getting together. I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I don't have you. And then when people are meeting, so what did you have dinner last night? And, and there is a social component to food. I mean, there is, you, know, you can have a great meal, and if you have a lousy person you're talking to, this is going to be a bad experience, and vice versa. So inherently, this is a social phenomenon. Inherently, trust comes into it. Inherently, the food experience comes into, uh, into play. And, and I think um, everybody has a, has, a, uh, has, has a place to play. With respect to the, 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 
the, you know, the business you do and what have you. There is one problem that, however, is, I think is important and you're starting to tackle it and kudos to you, is the issue of food waste. I mean, you were talking about the challenges of having to produce more and more food um, uh, with less and less space. When we started Kitchology, food waste was a very big focus and then we kind of tilted away. In this country, we waste $160 billion worth of food every year, $168 billion. India consumes $183 billion worth of food. Um, this ecosystem, as we get smarter, as we know when things are going to get ripe and you find the right recipes, or as, as you find the right safe additive that helps your food, uh, I think it's something that from an efficiency point of view, the overall ecosystem ought to think about. Um, so people will talk to others at the right time and then you know, work with others in the right matters. I'm mm -hmm. pretty convinced. And Jan, with C2 Sense, I mean, who is your ideal customer at the moment? I mean, it's it's a technology that could be applicable with consumers, with large industry members. I mean, who are you really targeting right now, and where are you going from there? Yeah, and it, it's an interesting question that we we discussed a lot at C2 Sense because there are really many opportunities. You can imagine that you put the sensor on every uh, packaging, and you track the quality of meat of of produce throughout the whole supply chain. You can imagine a handheld sensor that the consumer uses to pick the right uh, food when they shop at the supermarket. You can imagine something that's in a refrigerator that um, gives you the status of everything in there. So it's really something where, and this is also one reason why I'm very open to, to partnering with, with bigger companies that understand that each respective piece of the food and agriculture supply chain. So there's really more than one answer to it. We think. Right now, we think that uh, starting at retail might be quite interesting because there, between retail and the consumer, you see a lot of waste. Uh, quality uh, is an issue. The retailer wants to provide uh, top quality. The consumer is interested in purchasing it. So we think that could be a very interesting entry. But you can think of these solutions really all across the supply chain. And in the end, quality getting better quality and reducing waste is something that you, can, you have to solve at each single step eventually. And so switching gears a little bit, less about partnerships between large companies and small companies and startups and industry members and academia. Um, Larry, you know, I'm, I think it's fascinating what, what Monsanto is working on. I know, you know, obviously the company has had um, interesting feedback from consumers, I think, to put it, to put it lightly. But um, what can we expect from big ag right now? You know, in the next 10, 20 years, what are you working on? What is, you know, what, what should we expect to come from the Monsantos of the world? Uh, continually pushing the, the innovation and thinking beyond seeds and traits. So when in the lingo of, of big ag, uh, we, many of us, our competitors and us, we used to talk about seeds and traits, the, the actual seeds that you uh, buy and then the, the genes that make the traits that go into those. Uh, the shift now and what you're going to see going forward is uh, much beyond that. I mean, the kinds of things that I talked about, uh, information technology, uh, alternative ways of delivering traits, such as the, the RNAi, the, the uh, BioDirect, you know, understanding the microbiome and uh, really using that for the same, same ways and same reasons that they're, the same it will be done for human health. Um, instead of thinking about how to uh, solve some of the challenges that growers have with just a bag of seeds, start to think about a total solution where the, the, it's the seeds combined with the microbes, combined with the information and the data and the decisions to, um, to really enable the growers to make the best decisions and, uh, and increase the, the, the productivity, but uh, also in a sustainable way. You know, we are uh, stewards of this earth just like everybody else is, and so there are solutions that may uh, actually increase productivity, but only temporarily and not in a sustainable way, so clearly that's not an answer. So it's a, it's a total solutions package rather than just a bag of seeds. Mm -hmm. And Manaj, when you sort of hear about the plans for big ag and large you know, farms and, and you know, this massive amounts of produce and the supply that ultimately feeds products that PepsiCo is producing and creating and distributing, um, how do you, how do you 
you know, your title is director of foresight. So, you know, what do you envision for the sales of PepsiCo with, you know, different types of ag products coming in and, you know, sort of keeping in mind the future of big ag, but also, you know, sales and sort of regularity and what works for large um, companies like PepsiCo. Right. So foresight often gets confused with futurism. And, you know, in the small community of people who do this work, there are very hard divides. So futurists have a very definite point of view they advocate for. And foresight is a relatively more neutral, uh, it's a tool. Yeah? It's a way of thinking. And interestingly, the first assumption that foresight people make is the future is inherently unpredictable. So you sort of go from there. So it's a lot more around scenario planning and creating desirable futures for all of us. And that involves collaborations as well. Um, one of the things that you might, I'm sure you know about, is the you know, is the, is the foresight of our current CEO, Indra Nui, when she took over the company, or even before, sort of the transition we've made from being just a company of soda and chips to a lot of other things, including dairy, juices, Gatorade, you know, that's all come under her watch. So we've already begun to shift away from what we've realized doesn't fit into the future of the food ecosystem and what the world needs. And I expect some of this, as agriculture shifts and all of the other partners in this ecosystem shift, we look forward to being part of an entire movement that's shifting that stuff. And especially with a social lens. Uh, we talk about performance with purpose as sort of the guiding motto of the company. And even in that, there is evolution, you know, because some of you could, it, it is conceivable that people can criticize that sort of a motto as saying, Here's what, it's a sort of, it can be seen as a confessional model, you know? So you sin for six days, you go to church on the seventh day and wipe the slate clean. Uh, and that's typically what foundations have been accused of. And there's, there's a criticism that's valid, I think. And the way we're thinking about performance with purpose is build social conscience and an awareness of the entire system into the way we make money itself, right? So you don't have to do these sorts of confessional things. Mm. Um. Alan, I, uh, I'm so curious about the dietary preferences and, and the ability of Kitchology to, um, to kind of create a community around what you know, people are kind of facing and the restrictions that they have and, and the dietary preferences that they have. How does a company like that work with you know, a PepsiCo or work with kind of larger entities? Um, I suppose this is getting back to the partnerships thing, but um, how do you, uh, what is the vision for Kitchology in helping people deal with uh, kind of dietary restrictions? Um, well, the future, uh, let's see in two months where we think it is. Um, <laughs> first of all, with respect to the community, we, 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 we studied this. I mean, it's one advantage of having been around the block is you kind of pace yourself with respect to making decisions. It's frustrating to, to some, but it's helpful to others. Um, and we thought that at the center of food, in fact, are people. So you start from there, and it's not food that matters, it's food experience, and you, you, you take this first principle and conduct. Um, the way we've approached things is we believe that uh, everyone wants to experiment, and um, you, you find a recipe, you have a profile, you kind of experiment with it, and then you want to share it. I mean, one of the reasons why the food allergy community, which is 11 million household in the United States, so it's, it's a large market, but it's not the entire market, is important is because it's a community where if you find a solution, you want to share it with others. And the reason why we believe that modification and substitutions are important, um, it's because no one has the same profile as you do. Um, you, know, you have different families, you have different time pressure, you have different places where you buy your food. So there's always a certain amount of tweaking, and it's the tweaking that we believe is more powerful. Um, where we see um, the, the, the retailers and the brand to work on um, is we believe that a lot of people are taking pragmatic decisions. I mean, there are some competing apps on the web, and I will refer to them as you know, food Nazis or nutrition Nazis. And there are some groups um, that, you know, and I use definitively a devil word to kind of get people's attention, um, where they are, there is one mantra and you live with it and what have you. And we believe that people will make choices. I mean, you don't have a prepared meal every night. Uh, pizza, it's going to happen every now and again. So there is a pragmatic set of decisions that people will make. Uh, and as part of this pragmatic foodie or as part of this pragmatic experimenter, 
we believe that brands can, can play roles. They are recipes that they can provide. They are incentive that they can provide. They can engage into a dialogue. I mean, we've developed a platform, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, because um, too much, um, where dialogue with the consumers can be as part of the cooking process, as part of the preparations. We you know, embed the ability to have video from third parties and the like. Uh, or it could be kind of ancillary if you want to explore. And I think that these pragmatic decisions are important. Um, for the food allergy community, there is pragmatism and there's the absolute that if my child has sesame seed allergy, there will no be no sesame. And if you make me a recommendation that doesn't work, then I want the ability to feed that back to you and I don't want you to bury it. I want you to expose the flaws that you have in your system in that platform and we've taken great pain to have like a leaderboard of goofs, mm -hmm. which is gonna make our, our curating team really go nuts because you know, this is something that we found people are willing to use. So, there is, there is, you know, folks that uh, want to cultivate their own food, you know, they'll be able to bring those ingredients in. But we believe that uh, the traditional retailers and new retailers are part of this ongoing uh, dialogue. And as long as it's uh, uh, transparent and allow for pragmatism, we believe that there is a lot of opportunity for for people to participate. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd like to open it up to the audience. I, you've been hearing you know, a lot of interesting perspectives on the future of food. Um, what are you interested in hearing more about? Rick? <laughs> My name is uh, Rick Whitney. I'm a graduate student uh, studying food systems. Um, and this is a kind of a new move for me um, because I think food, the future of food is very uh, fascinating. But I spent the past 20 years working in digital strategy, digital product development, mobile applications, websites, that kind of thing, software. Um, and by virtue of that, I've been in a very disruptive space for a very long time. Um, I think we all know that the, you know, Hollywood is much different than it was 20 years ago. Um, publishing is much different than it was 20 years ago. Medicine, the Uber, we heard a lot about the Uber, Uberification of everything. Um, as a very multi-multi-billion dollar industry, I think food is ripe for disruption. Um, in your view, whether you're from a very large company like Pepsi or Monsanto, or whether you're in a startup, what do you think the biggest disruptors are that you're seeing or that you're anticipating, and how are you participating in or reacting to that? I'll go first, and I'll try to be short. I hate the word disruption. Yes. Uh, yes. I just wanted to put it out there. I much prefer the word tinkering. I think they mean the same thing, or at least describe the same set of behaviors. Um, and again, I have no formal position on Uber, but I do think Uber is not as much disrupting something or is it not part of the sharing economy, certainly, as some people assume. It's actually exploiting sort of under-leveraged resources within existing systems, is the way I look at Uber. And I think I made that point because I think there's a lot of under-leveraged resources in the food system or stuff that nobody's looked at. I love food waste as a perfect example. So there's a lot of attention on, you know, the challenge gets framed in terms of populations growing, we need to feed them, and that's a challenge. Well, nobody's looking at we can feed the planet right now if we stop wasting all this food. And that's a systemic problem as well. It's easy to point to some people and say, why are you over-consuming or buying more food? You can blame the invention of supermarkets for that, lots of things. You can blame the increasing disconnection of people from how food is made. You know, it's become a largely invisible process. You could blame any of those things, but does doesn't get you anywhere. But kind of looking at solving food waste systematically is a way, I think, of you could frame it as disruption if that's your flavor, but I would call it it's an under-leveraged resource in the existing system that if enough people look at it, we can make very pragmatic headway. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll just talk about agriculture itself, uh, the source of the food supply. And, and I, you know, again, it may sound like a broken record, but the kinds of things that I, I talked about in my short talk about the precision um, you know, farms, a lot of food comes from very large farms. It's impossible at this point to really think about that in square feet or square meters and treat each one differently. But with the kind of information that we can get on that, at that resolution, and then the ability to use that information to 
make decisions meter by meter or even, you know, ultimately someday seed by seed. So I, I often imagine what if I could go out and plant my, my, my farm one seed at a time and every seed goes in at a slightly different depth or something like that or a slightly different treatment. Um, you know, up until now that's basically been impossible. You make one big decision, and I, I know that's oversimplifying, but one big decision or group of decisions and then apply that to the entire field. Uh, to get more precise about it, I think is where the disruption is going to happen. I used to—I'm a biotech guy, and and I've got a, a bit of a breeding background, and I thought that's where all the increases were going to come from. Um, but I think getting way more precise without any advances in breeding and biotech—that alone is going to um, really improve what comes out of a farm and make it more sustainable. I think DNA and your DNA is the biggest massive disruptor we face. For the whole 20th century, consumers, all of us, had zero control over the choices we made and what we choose to eat. Lots of advice, conflicting, often wrong, driven by advertising, driven by branding and packaging, but none of it matched who we were. It was a trial and error wandering through the desert now think about what the mobile world has done for us. I view digital nutrition as the Google Maps of nutrition. Where you start is your DNA. Where you want to go is somewhere. There are lots of ways to get there. Some are better than others. I don't care what you choose, but you should have some insight into what the choices are and how to get there. I think that when you tap into your genetic makeup and you map that to the choices you make in regarding food, you begin making new choices about things that control your weight. It means you make new choices about the things that give you better payoffs in your performance physically and mentally. We know that the, there's a ton of science out there. there. There's a genetic basis for how much sugar you eat. There's a gene that interacts with a high fat diet that at 30% above 30%, your obesity linearly increases as the amount of fat in your diet. Guess what diet's a high fat diet? Atkins. So if you have that gene, Atkins works against you. Why are we in a world where we want to have people fighting each other over what's right or wrong, ignoring the one basic element that we all share that is in common, but not identically, which is our DNA? So that, to me, is the disruptive uh, component that's driven by the technology of mobile, back-end technologies, and so on, makes it available cheap for everybody. I'll just I'll just say briefly uh, what what interests me. I don't I don't know that it's I, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, so I don't know if it's the largest disruption. But what interests me and the reason that we're starting Grove is because uh, by empowering and educating people, we can keep the whole industry honest. Uh, I I don't trust uh, I don't trust sort of corporations as a whole. And maybe Grove once it gets really big, uh, will be the same way. I just don't trust. Uh, the sort of double or triple bottom line as much as I trust sort of empowering and educating everybody around the world, even if it starts small and spreads, spreads and spreads. Uh, I think that's how we can really change the whole system. Uh, for, you know, for our specific case at Grove, empowering people to grow their own fruits and vegetables, uh, it's not unfathomable. I mean, in, with the Victory Gardens around World War II, uh, the, US was, uh, the U.S. population was growing 45% of its own uh, fruits and vegetables right at home. Uh, so when you can have that sort of societal shift and understanding, uh, I think that's, that's the kind of disruption that, that I want to, to bring, because it'll keep everybody honest. That's brilliant. I think, I think demand needs to be edu educated to make supply change as well, so it makes perfect sense in the world. And we're fond of referring to the people formerly known as consumers. So I think consumerism itself <laughs> is sort of a problematic paradigm, and I'm glad it's being disrupted. Um, just to add one more thing, in terms of disruptors, the discovery of the gut brain, I would propose, is going to change. And we don't even know. We're just scratching the surface of what Sorry. the gut brain does. The gut brain. We have nerve cells down here, and apparently more nerve cells than we have up here. Um, and the little that I've read about it, people are hypothesizing that it's involved in emotional regulation not just within ourselves as individuals, but in an ecosystem of people. So this idea of walking into this, in roof, this room and saying, I feel the vibe, 
used to be thought of 15 years ago as a very California thing to say and <laughs> lots of woo-woo stuff. Now it represents the cutting edge of our knowledge about human beings. Yeah, another question? <coughs> Diane. <coughs> Just talk. My name is Di oh yeah, there we go. My name is Diane Williams. I'm in the process of developing a startup in um, healthcare. How and this this is a question to the general panel. How are you going to gain consumer confidence and trust in the way that the data is collected? When you're talking about genetics, profiling, um, all this personal information. So what are the larger companies doing to secure, not only secure the information, but to give the consumer trust in what you're doing with the information you gather? Well, I, I, I think that, that the privacy issue becomes most important when you talk about disease issues because they impact uh, insurance, it impacts uh, employment, and things like that. From what I've observed in uh, a few decades in the IT field and, and software, um, Google collects information on everybody all the time. And nobody's holding strikes and marching outside about what Google's collecting. Uh, data by itself isn't going to be a, a terrible, terribly bad thing. 20 years ago, uh, the dean of the AU Law School wrote a, a paper called Privacy is Gone, Pandora's Out of the Box. So the issue really is that uh, anyone who collects data, any of our companies that collects data, does have an, at least some kind of obligation to tell you, the person whose data we're collecting, that we will do reasonable things to protect it, that we just won't share it out there wherever we feel like doing it, that if we do share it, that it's anonymized, because big data can, can yield uh, good research results. Uh, but at the end result, uh, we're collecting data all the time on everything you do. And um, if, we are, if we act irresponsibly, uh, there will be some severe consequences. But I think most of us will respond appropriately. I think that's a question the consumer is asking. You know, a well-educated consumer is asking himself. You know, if I give you my genetics, what are you going to do with it? It's, an, it's, yeah. a, it's going to be an adoption curve like everything else. The early adopters aren't going to be worried about it then as they find there's confidence growing, later adopters and later, and there will be some people who will never give up a genetic profile uh, under the threat of death. So I mean, I think we just to face the fact that there's an adoption curve for all new things, and DNA is simply one of them. I, I figure, you know, oh, go, sorry. Go, no, I, go ahead. So the, I'll answer the question in a, not so much a personal information way, because we're not mapping people's genomes or anything like that, but. You know, let's face it, it's, uh, you know, Monsanto does have a reputation issue. Everybody knows that. Um, and, and it's really with the consumer. And uh, I think one of the things that we realize that we did wrong that we're trying to change now is we focused on the farmer because Monsanto is, at least we thought, we're not in the food industry. We're in the farming industry. Lo and behold, everybody else sees Monsanto as being part of the food industry. And so what we're trying to do now is embrace that um, you know, the, our customer is actually the farmer. We deliver our product to the farmer. Um, but that then goes into the food chain, and so people see us as being part of the food industry. We realize that. We're starting to engage in conversations. That's one of the reasons I'm here today. I'm a molecular biologist here to, trying to talk about food. <laughs> and so I think we're just trying to um, participate in the conversation, do a lot of listening, and just be part of the conversation rather than just focusing on the farmer. Well, obviously, a lot of the success of these products, which are fabulous, are going to be connected by how much the consumer yeah. actually trusts what you're doing with the technology. Exactly. Sure. Uh, uh, just, uh, to, just to quickly add to and echo what Frederick was saying, transparency is going to be key, uh, I think. Great. Just in terms of the contract, you know, and I won't mention any specific companies, but the contracts that we have now make me think of a Tom Waits quote. I'm glad to be quoting Tom Waits at MIT. Um, he says, the large print giveth and the small print taketh away. Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's, that's the nature of the contract now. It's very misleading. And I think more companies have to give thought to, is it, is it a reasonable expectation of what you're communicating to the consumer in, in, in this bargain? Echoing the echo, 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 echo. I think transparency is very important. Uh, I think you have to, first of all, you have to protect the data. 
um, uh, extensively and uh, you know, some of the question before about the big disruption is I think now people are realizing food is health and the difference between food wellness and food and health is kind of overlap. So the way you're treating information about what people do for food, I think you should treat, we certainly are, the same way you're dealing with um, you know, information about medical conditions and the like. Um, I think that you have uh, to be transparent. You have to say, are you showing it? I think there is more and more of an expectation when you're making recommendations that you're using your profile information. Um, there is a couple of, um, papers, uh, the name escapes me, about the expectations in five to ten years going to be that, uh, it's called yeah, the precision economy, that's the name of the, the paper, that people are expecting something to be customized as part of the shopping experience because they know the data is being collected. I think you have to be very careful. I think there is going to be, uh, and I'm not a futurist or foresightist and what have you, but there's going to be at one moment an abuse by someone somehow. And I think what uh, people have to be prepared for is what happens in the aftermath. And I'm not talking about, you know, Congress slash kangaroo court, uh, you know, holding hearings and the like. Uh, but there's going to be, you know, someone is bound to abuse it, uh, whether it's an insurance company that finds it on the way or, or whomever. I have nothing against insurance companies. Um, and, and I think that you have to be, as a participant in the industry, uh, or as an industry in general, understand there's going to be some hiccups and be able to, to react to them. Uh, people like to be uh, you know, things customized to them, but it's kind of spooky every now and then, a precise cookie on the web. Um, and as long as you're transparent and as long as you're not trying to collect information which you have no right to collect, per se, and you kind of intuitively know, why are we collecting this piece of info? We're never going to do anything from it. If you're going to do anything from it, just don't collect it, period. Let me add one thing. In the DNA level, it's, I think, a good example. All data is not equal. And not e all data is not equally sensitive. In the DNA area, disease uh, genetic information has a high sensitivity. But in normal function, it's pretty benign. So my genetic profile, for example, indicates that I am less agreeable than other people. There's a gene for agreeableness. And I do not have the gene for sugar consumption. Now, I've just shared that with 50 people that I don't know. I don't really care, because this is not going to change my life in any significant way. But when you talk about some of the more sensitive things, then the threshold uh, becomes higher, and the challenge to make sure that the appropriate protections are there. So. You want to share something more interesting? <laughs> <laughs> Just I've, got, I've got other genes in my portfolio that are happy to share. <laughs> we'll have a beer. Catherine? So everything that I'm hearing is wonderful and coming from people with uh, data-driven brains, as, as is mine. And it's presuming that uh, humans will behave in a logical manner. You give them the information that they need, and they will... Um, behave logically, and that's what I spent the first two years of my company doing, saying give them the information, make everything research-based, and, um, and you can educate them, and, and it'll work. Um, what are the ideas for how to take irrational human beings, um, how are you going to bridge that gap between the irrationality of human beings and the perfectness of the data that you're producing? Uh, question of the day. By the way, you should have left me out of your opening statement. I, I didn't announce myself as necessarily data-driven. Foresight's actually a very imaginative function, so it's more of an integration thing. But you raise a really good point. I think one of the ways that, uh, again, not to go back to the disruption or tinkering thing, we, I don't see a lot of approaches that start with the assumption that eating and drinking is very emotional. Right? It's an emotional activity. In the, pop, the popular culture seems ahead of all of us who are studying this stuff because people use things like stress eating and they know what they're talking about in real life. And somehow industry and big companies and small companies have been kind of late to this game of looking at this paradigm as an emotional paradigm. And I would question, I don't think it's irrational, it's a different form of reasoning. Right? Pascal says like passion has its own reasons that reason knows nothing about. So it's a different form of reasoning and I think as more and more and I'm not just talking about neuroscience and peering into the brain, but as more and more people are studying emotion and understanding that, I think the advances in that field will have a lot to say about how we eat and drink. I think the concept of rationality is the notion that data-driven rationality set presumes a single choice is the best choice, but that doesn't, it isn't true. The fact is people make choices based on their own needs, their own desires, uh, where they see themselves in the world. Go back again to Google Maps. 
what choice you make in driving up to a place is up to you. Whether it's irrational to somebody else doesn't make any difference. It's, it's, it's your choice. So as long as you give people choices and the power to make choices, they will make choices that are in their own best interest. It may not be a good choice from someone else's point of view. It may not work out well from, in fact, but that doesn't make it irrational. It simply makes it the choice they made. And I think it, we don't want to confuse this data model that seems to drive things with the fact that people do make choices in their own best interest. Why don't empower them to make, improve that in any way we can? I think you were also trying to tee up the whole Yaley approach, right? Yale and Nudge and uh, those guys. And I think context, I mean, I spoke, I touched on very briefly about context. I don't want to make this sound like a paternalistic, you know, we should nudge people because we know better sort of a thing. But I think a lot of, uh, Alain's been talking about experience. We've been talking about behaviors. And I think if, I'll put it in PepsiCo's terms, if we stop thinking we're a food and beverage company, and thinking we're an eating and drinking company, not only does a perspective for innovation become bigger, but you also discover all sorts of other ways to guide people's choices rather than just a standard, what you put on the package, what's in the nutritional label, et cetera. There's lots of interesting, entertaining ways you can guide people towards choices. Uh, and context, I think, is gonna be a big part of it. I think there are also several parts to, to your question. I think we've gotten much better uh, dealing with big data, getting recommendations out of a collection of data that we don't immediately understand because it's, it's such a huge accumulation. So uh, getting to recommendations from there that are really, that seem useful to, the, to someone in the supply chain, to the consumer, I think that's one step. I think the other step is how to feed, what type of data to feed into that yeah. uh, collection. I mean, this is coming from, from our side where you can collect all kinds of data from packaged meat, from uh, fruit, uh, from vegetables, but maybe the information you can collect now is not really the information that gives the consumer the best recommendation. Maybe you need to collect something else. And I think it's really the data you put into it, uh, what recommendations you get out of it, and deciding how simplified does it need to be to be really useful to the consumer, um, and how much choice you still want to leave. For a consumer, he might be interested in knowing is that avocado three days from having to be eaten or five, but they might not need to know it, you know, based on how many hours or minutes to they have left. So really making that choice might help quite a bit with adaption and really being helpful to consumers, not just supplying data. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Yes? John? <laughs> If I was going to make a very bold statement without complete, with complete lack of knowledge in the area, but then Larry alluded to it twice. Um, all of this discussion is wonderful and all the information that we got is wonderful, but I think there's a missing link here. And it's that microbiome that Larry's talking about. Uh, in, if I have a whole ton of bugs in my digestive system that have more than my, uh, you know, human cells. And those things are responsible for processing the food that I put into my system. Then what's the impact of that? Um, and that applies to agriculture and everything else. So I think there's a whole area there. I know there's a whole area in there where a lot of very interesting things are happening. So talking about disruption, that might be an area. Of yes. course. And it, you know, what we're talking about is that there are other dimensions to the system that was put up there earlier today. And that's simply another element of the system. And when you begin analyzing that and you factor that in, it makes the choice opportunities richer. It clarifies the distinctions that we have to make for people. And so these are all additive um, components. It's not, if we make it an either or, choose the microbiome or then we're making a mistake. But if we begin aggregating these things together and see how they layer together, the technology on the back end of information processing, information capture, so on, allows us to begin doing this work and deliver it to you in a simplified form. We can't deliver it in a complex form because you won't use it, but deliver it to you in a form that you can use to make the decision at this moment. And I think that's really where the future is and where the technologies are converging. 
And maybe to, to add to that, I think uh, there has been a lot of talk about innovation in energy, innovation in, in biotech, innovation in all kinds of fields. And this is all very valid. And I think it's very important to have innovation there. But my impression is that food has sometimes been a little bit underestimated. Food is huge. And um, companies like PepsiCo, like Monsanto, have, have been working in the field, have made a lot of, of progress. But maybe it hasn't been so much on the radar of, of upcoming startups if we look 10 or 20 years back. So adding all different components, like the one, the one you mentioned, the ones we've referred today, a lot of others, I think they are all needed to provide the types of solution we, we need to get to to really uh, drive progress forward. So I think the field is huge. It's not just one solution. I think we need a lot of things too uh, for, for food and agriculture. Wonderful. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, just thinking about the conversation today, so fascinating to hear about so many of the startups, um, both that pinched, pitched earlier and some that um, gave more presentations. Um, I think we have a very bright future to look forward to um, in food. And it sounds like, you know, the the system is really moving towards a more consumer-centric, transparent, and truthful um, food organization. And so for, for that, I commend all of you on the work that you're doing. And um, it was great to have you be part of the presentation today. Um, I imagine you'll all be sticking around for a little while so people can braid you with a diff different questions. But, um, and then thank you all for coming. It's been great to have you. And, and congratulations to a successful event, Trond. And thanks very much to the panel and to uh, our excellent moderator. I try to summarize the event in hashtags. It should be coming up in a second. It's very hard to summarize an event in hashtags, but I, I think it should be up there. Diet, sensors, hashtag honesty, farms, DNA, experience, tech, consumers, and not to forget microbes. So thanks <laughs> very much. That should be coming up very soon. Thanks for attending. Next month, we are putting on cybersecurity, innovation, very exciting field, used to be a very specialized field. It is not specialized, my friends. It is probably the most important thing to discuss today. Our lives are at stake, our identities are at stake. It is not a joking topic, but it's very exciting. So thanks very much, and uh, see you next time. Thanks for coming.